Long drive. Way back. It might be. It should be. Holy cow. <laughs> Christopher Carabina was born in 1914 in St. Louis, Missouri. Orphaned by the age of 10, Harry was taken in by an aunt, Doxy Argent. He just felt that he didn't really belong at that time. To, he had no one close to him. You know, he had no brothers and sisters. His mother and father died. And uh, he did finally live with an aunt, as I understand in St. Louis, and she had about four children, I think. And he realized that he was living there, but he never felt that that was really his family, his home. I think he grew up with a basic mistrust of just about everyone. And when you have that, it's difficult to make real close friends. Now, Harry had some friends, but it took a long time to gain his trust. I guess he felt like there was no uh, place for him, and he never really liked to talk about his childhood, and so I never pushed it. Harry was devoted to making it, and he succeeded against all odds. He grew up very poor, and he was a guy that had to work very, very hard from the time he was seven or eight years old, not only to, to make a living, but just to survive, to eat. And I think that, that that carried over into his personal life, it carried over into his professional life. and. The reason why he ultimately made it to the Hall of Fame as the son of immigrants and an orphan was because he had a single-minded devotion and passion to making it. He was very close-mouthed, except he told me he used to sell newspapers. He was a paper boy. His father deserted the family when he was very young. His father had gone back to the old country, and uh, when he heard that Dad had become a success, he wrote him a letter, and Dad took the letter and threw it away unopened. Long drive, way back, it might be, it should be, it is, holy cow. By his early 20s, Harry discovered his lifelong passion and pursued a career as a sports announcer. The way Harry Carey struck me first was that while he was compelling to listen to, he was so much more bombastic than the announcers I was used to in New York. <laughs> was emotional in terms of excitement on the air, you know, and his devotion to the Cardinals or the White Sox and then the Cubs. Remember the stance and the swing. We're not likely to see his likes again. Well, I got into broadcasting after being a reporter because of the excitement of being at the game and being part of it, but, you know, I used to mimic guys like Harry Carey in the backyard throwing up the ball and hitting the ball and, and pretending something was happening and and broadcasting it like a, a Harry Carey would do. Back in the early 50s, the Cardinals, just like today, have the biggest radio network of any major league professional sports team. And also their flagship station, KMOX in St. Louis, at nighttime can reach 38 states. So they had an incredible reach. At nighttime, on the farm, I would take a baseball and throw it off the barn roof and hit it when it came down, but I always had a radio plugged in. And when I first started doing this, when I was 10 or 11 years old, I'd bring the radio out of the house and plug it in in the granary, and I'd start turning the stations going away from the left. You get to 11.20 on the dial, and all of a sudden, it was like magic coming through the air. Here's the real A. He is out at the plate. Cardinals win 4-3. Holy cow. 
And once I started listening to this guy, I said, that's it. That's my guy. And that was my introduction to Harry Carey. The Cardinals are arguing, how in the world can he keep out of a man's way when he's down on the ground? That the base runner's the man who's got to get out of the way, and there's really a robot going on. But also his innate sense of drama and how to use his voice and inflections and silences and little asides on the radio. He was almost, with himself and his own voice and personality as the only instrument, he was almost like a guy conducting an orchestra. The announcers didn't feel uh, the game the way I did. Uh, the nuances and the positions and the, the, the way the pitcher was working and the way the outfielders moved around, the catcher set it up. All these things made an impression on me. I mean, Dad did a lot of television, but he was a radio announcer. They happened to put a monitor in his booth one day and a camera, but it didn't change the way he broadcast the game, which was part of the charm. Harry was your voice of the game. He was your image of, of baseball here in St. Louis. Uh, radio was so dominant, it was the only way that you could get the news about the baseball game. So Harry Carey gave them their image on radio. After Robinson has stopped and third and says, come on home, buddy, they interfered with you. Meanwhile, he was just bleeding from the head out there. He told the story of the game from the perspective of a guy sitting in his living room or sitting at a bar having a beer with his friends, and he let it rip. Uh, I was watching a Sox game one time, and um, the Sox were getting killed by the Baltimore Orioles, and it was late in a, a doubleheader game, and B.B. Richard went over and picked up a beer cup that somebody had thrown on the field, and Harry said, that's the first clean pickup he's made all day. There's a drive, way back. It might be, it could be, it is a home run. But the fans loved him because they were seeing and reacting to the same thing. So if somebody was out there at shortstop, for instance, making an error, he would address that in graphic terms. He was just disheartened, just like a fan. He, he told the game in the way that the fan saw the game. If they were excited, he was excited, and if they were upset because of a play was made incorrectly, then he was upset. Harry loved the Cardinal fans just as much as they loved him. He called the game as a fan would, making him a man of the people. Well, I, I just think that the average fan related to him. You know, he didn't speak above people. You know, we get some people today in broadcasting who get too cerebral. I don't want to know all that stuff. You know, give me the basics. Harry combined a deep knowledge of the game with unbridled enthusiasm. This made him an instant success in St. Louis. Here's the pitch. Right there, there it is! Into left field! Hit number 3,000! A run is scored! Busey the run first! On his way to second with a double! And I got KMOX radio on, picking up the Cardinal game. And Harry Carey comes back from the seventh inning. And he says, I've just been informed that I've been let go at the end of the year as a Cardinals announcer. And then he starts his laugh. He's like, oh, instead of getting a gold watch, I'm getting a pink slip. And he laughed the famous laugh. I'm thinking, here's a guy just found out during a commercial break. He's being fired. How can they be letting Harry Carey go? On the stretch, one and one. Here's the man behind the runner at second base. Stopping. When he, it was a tragedy when he left St. Louis, and it was shocking to the uh, to the people here. Harry was uh, just part of the Cardinals. So it was a sad day, but Harry never lost uh, his his fan base here. There's anyone who was of my vintage and my era uh, would know that Harry Carey was such a great part of the Cardinal legacy, you know, and still enjoyed listening to him on his uh, other ventures in Chicago. And while Carey had created an unforgettable legacy with the Cardinals, rumors began to circulate. A couple of the sports writers cornered and said, Harry, really kind of hate to bring this up, but there was a rumor that you left St. Louis because you were having an affair with a beautiful 35-year-old blonde wife of a brewery executive. What do you have to say about that? And Harry said, well, it was a dozen years ago I left St. Louis, and he said I was as fat then as I am now. It was like an, a, a boost to my ego that somebody would think that I'd steal some executive's wife who happened to be a beautiful 24-year-old Hollywood starlet type 
married to a billionaire stud, the very thought that somebody would think that I could break up that kind of a marriage when I was in my 40s at that time, I found a, a so impossible to believe, so impossible that I'd rather have the people believe it and lose my job. <laughs> Channel 5 came in to do a live interview with me. I would hold up a schlitz knowing that would burn up everybody at Anheuser Bush. That was Harry's team. He grew up in St. Louis. That was a team that he really loved. Did he ever get St. Louis entirely out of his blood? I don't think you ever get out of your blood the place where you're brought up and the first team you broadcast for. Putting St. Louis behind him, Harry moved west and joined the Oakland A's in 1970. You know, Harry is such a professional, and he realized that there's pitfalls in, in this this business, and he took it all in stride. He said, hey, you know, I got fired uh, for whatever reason. He had a chance to go out with uh, his good friend Charlie Finley in Oakland. It was obvious that Harry wasn't going to stay out there. I talked to him one time, and he says, you know, Harry, uh, Charlie's my friend, but I don't think I could work for him very long. He said he called me in the booth the other day, and I'm doing the game, and Charlie had this mule he called Charlie O their mascot when they'd parade him around the field. And Harry's signature always was holy cow. So Charlie calls from his box down on the behind the dugout and says, Harry, I got a terrific idea. He says, you know, I got my mule, Charlie O, and you always say holy cow. When Finley wanted him to say holy mule because of that mule he had out in the boat that day, that was enough. Dad told me, he said, I got to get out of here. And Harry told me, he said, boy, <laughs> I can't go for that. <laughs> but not all was bad in Harry's life. Earlier that year, friends had introduced him to Dolores Goldman, nicknamed Dutchie. I met him in uh, St. Louis. We stopped at this uh, restaurant in St. Louis called Brennan's. Anyway, Harry came over and he started talking to us. And I don't know, one thing led to another, and that's how we first met. Dutchie and Harry got married on May 19, 1975, in Chicago. Dutchie was the single person in Harry's life that could bark at him and have him jump. I, I never saw anything like it. It was so fantastic. After just one season in sunny California, Harry Carey was ready to move on, and he headed back to his roots in the Midwest, to the city of Chicago. I said, you got to get back in the Midwest. And, and, and I said, the White Sox had just got new owners. I said, Harry, you ought to go and talk to the White Sox. And he'd say, they know I'm available. I know I'm available. And I had a good friend, uh, Don Umford, who was an uh, executive with the White Sox. And he and I were friends. And I talked to Don. I said, Don, you, gotta, you guys ought to hire Harry Carey. I got a call at my office from Bel Belvec saying he wanted to talk about hiring Harry and asked if I would meet him for dinner. And so uh, I arranged with Harry for him to come to my office beforehand. So I would run him through a routine whereby we would be able to have this negotiation. I explained to him what I wanted him to do, is not to talk. And I, and I would arrange the seating so that I sat between them so I could turn to Vec and talk to him. And Harry would be to my back. And if I wanted him to talk, I would turn to him, and that would be his signal to talk, to enter into the conversation. Otherwise, stay out of the negotiations. So uh, I said to Mr. Vec, with my back to Harry, I said, do you want to talk business first? Do you want to eat first? How do you want to do this? He said, let's get the business out of the way. And he leaned over in front of me, bypassed me, and he said to Harry, I want you to work for the White Sox. Harry leaned over in front of me and said, that's a deal. And the whole audience, the whole restaurant stood up and applauded because they heard this negotiation of Harry and Vec on it. And I turned to the two of them and I said, I don't think I get paid. I mean, do I, or, you know, I get paid for this thing? And, just, and Vec laughed and he said, just have dinner, it's on me, that's your compensation. Harry transcended all the ages. He was Mr. Chicago. He became Mr. Chicago. He was uh, like Irv Kupson to a degree. You know, they, those guys became synonymous with the city of Chicago. And, he had a style unlike any other style. Harry was right at home in Chicago, feeding off the energy of the city. Chicago and Harry seemed like a good match. Um, there's kind of a rollicking aspect to the city of Chicago. Uh, it's a city of neighborhoods, a city where loyalties matter, uh, a city that prides itself on not 
suffering fools or phonies gladly. Well, you know, Chicago's a great city, and, and you know, they got the greatest fans in the world, and when they like you, they like you, and when they don't like you, they don't like you. Um, and there's something kind of earthy and real about, about Harry. Plus, you know, none of this matters if you can't deliver. The guy was just so entertaining. Hey! Check out the kid in the sombrero. <laughs> There's a good looking youngster, huh? He was more concerned what celebrities showed up. Hey, Charlie Manson's here today. A group of 50 from Joliet State Prison. Because it's parole day here in Wrigley. There's a grand slam. Harry's announcing partner was the legendary Jimmy Pearsall and they were the one-two punch the White Sox broadcast needed. I was watching a game once. This is when Jimmy Pearsall and Harry Carey were more popular than the team when they were with the White Sox. And people would actually go to the game because they were more of a highlight. But they didn't hold back any punches. I mean, they said whatever they felt like. It was like watching a game with, you know, your drunk uncle or two drunk uncles <laughs> because they didn't edit themselves. And that was the beauty of it. And they were almost like a comedy team. One game, they were just going down the roster about, you know, everybody's salary and what they were making and because of how poor they were playing. And he's going, look at this guy. Bill Melton's making $700,000 a year, and he's batting 235. How does he look the owner in the eye when he collects his check? He's got to have a ski mask on and a gun, because all he's doing is ripping the club off. And Harry would say some things that uh, you probably couldn't say on TV today, but you know what? It was Harry. It was Harry Carey, and it, it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was what it was. I mean, he, he was just so good for the game of baseball, so good for the city of Chicago. Spoken. We said we thought we, we were working with a last place ball club after the first year. Here comes the throw, but now watch the runner. Boy, this look is remarkable. Look, look at this. Whoop, whoop, See, whoop, 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 Harry and Jimmy wore the entire show. And I remember watching White Sox games, as painful as it would be, and they didn't draw in those days. They didn't draw. And Harry and Jimmy, late in the game, would start counting fans. And they'd say 16, 17, 18 behind the dugout, 22, 23, 24 in the left field corner. There's nine more in the upper deck. There's at least 1,500 here tonight. Initially, Harry's contract with the White Sox included an attendance clause that he'd get paid extra for helping fill the stands. But after a few seasons, Sox management knew they'd go broke if they kept this promise. He was the lifeblood that kept that franchise alive. Never admired any man in my life any more than I admired Bill Beck. But Bill was so badly under budget that it was Harry, Harry's link with the fans that kept that barely over a million plus annually coming out to that ballpark. Trying to formulate another successful gimmick, Bill Veck came up with one of his best ideas yet, to let Harry conduct the seventh inning stretch. A two, a three, take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. He, uh, Harry would always get up and kind of go through the motions of singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game in the booth. So they, the story goes that Bill Veck put a live mic in the booth for Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Harry went into Bill and said, I can't sing. And Bill says, that's why you're going to, because if, if you had a good voice, everybody would be listening. But since you can't sing, he said, uh, everybody will sing along with you. He really started a lot of rallies with that seventh inning stretch, and uh, uh, nobody could do it better. I mean, this man just knew how to get a crowd going and pump up a, a ball club, and uh, uh, it was just wonderful.
In 1981, a new owner came into the picture. Jerry Reinsdorf took over the White Sox, and after 10 great years, Harry decided to move on. In 1979, Jack Brickhouse met uh, with the people at WGN, and he told them of his plans to leave the broadcasting booth in 1981. Jim Dowdle, who was the head of Tribune Broadcasting, knew that both Harry and Jack were box office. When I heard that it went to the Cubs, I went, uh-oh, he must be repaying some kind of debt to Satan to go to the Cubs. It was the ultimate slap in the face to the south side of Chicago. We've got your announcer. And so moving from the south side Sox to the north side Cubbies was Chicago's favorite baseball announcer. Harry Carey. Whoa! There's a long drive way back. Might be Cubs, Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Holy cow! Is that a happy team? He didn't have any trouble with, with the with the sacks. Reinsdorf took over the uh, the team. And when he bought the team, they offered Harry the job of doing the broadcast for the Sox, but it would be on the Sports Vision. At that time, I think, if I remember correctly, had like 18,000 subscribers. And Harry turned down the job because his, for the one reason, it was, that was solely because he uh, wouldn't broadcast, he wouldn't leave behind his, his uh, audience. That's when we got the call from, from Jim Dowdle. He took the job for, for the, with the Cubs for far less money than Mr. Reinsdorf offered him. Uh, to do the cable, uh, and it just so happened it led to wonderful things, and he made a lot of money and, and made everybody happy, and WGN Superstation and stuff went on to great things. I said, Harry, do you want this deal? And he said, sure, I want this deal. I said, your agents are making it very tough. I said, because if I go back in that room and they start trying to negotiate this deal, I said, I'm getting up and walking out and denying that I was ever here again. So Harry says, well, you know I don't like talking about money. Money, I don't like talking about money. So we go back into the room and Harry said, okay, guys, shut up. <laughs> he reaches his hand out and he said, we got a deal. There it way back, it might be. In Chicago, he was Mr. Bud and Mr. Cub. <laughs> this is the man of Chicago. Oh, hello. He is history. I'm not, no, you are not going to cut this short. <laughs> the Cubs are still riding the wave of what Harry brought to Chicago. And the move by Jim Doddle and the Tribune Company choose Harry as their number one broadcaster, knowing that they had a bad product. And if you have a bad product, you get the best salesman in the world to sell it. And they got the best salesman in Harry Carey, and the rest as they say, is history. He knew what Harry Carey's value was. He knew how to maximize Harry Carey's value. He understood how to galvanize a public that wanted to be galvanized. Harry could sit down with the toughest negotiators in the world. You deal with Budweiser, you aren't dealing with Mary Poppins. You better be able to damn well sell that product. Harry could do it. Once a year, we met at the uh, Ambassador East at the pump room at table number one and negotiated his contract. It was a yearly ritual, and which was two, three hours of uh, a lot of fun because Harry would uh, bring up why he was underpaid and all the various aspects that he's doing for the Cubs. And maybe three or four years into it, he, one time we're sitting there and he said, but he said, you know, my young kid, Skip, is making more than I'm making. And I said, Harry, how low can you get bringing your kid into this thing? I said, come on. And he said, well, I got to make more than my kid. When he came over to the Cubs, um, he brought our franchise. He certainly helped bring that franchise to life. Uh, he electrified it. I think he humanized it. Um, and he was one of these bigger-than-life characters and lived by the mantra. And I admired him for this, uh, live it up, the meter's running. The Cubs were a great fit for Harry. Uh, Wrigley Field, the history of the team, beloved but star-crossed, but the hope of a new day. 
You know, Harry's voice, even into his 80s, always expressed that hope of a new day, a new season, first inning, start over, get him tomorrow, get him next year, you know? I used to just love the enthusiasm he had for the game. The Cubs could be losing 16-1 to 1 in the bottom of the ninth, and he's like, ladies and gentlemen, don't let the scar mislead you. I know the Cubs are losing 16-1, to 1, but they got the bases loaded. Nobody out. Leon Durham out the plate. Holy cow, anything can happen. Hold on to your seats. Oh, for the long one, if they can just get a hold of it. Harry, lighten up. The game's over. Everything seemed to be in place, but the number two man, Harry, needed a new broadcast partner. I was in the Ambassador East Hotel. Harry lived at the Ambassador East, and I went down to the paper stand and a bellhop said two papers for Mr. Carey. And I remembered that Harry stayed there. So I sent up my card and Harry goes, where are you? I said the ambassador East. He said, don't go anywhere. He goes, they're looking for a partner for me and you're one of the names I gave him. So I'm gonna have a guy give you a call. And Jim Dowdle called me in my room and he said, we wanna come downtown and talk about the Cubs. Talk about perhaps broadcasting for them. So I went downtown, we talked. He said, if you're doing this as a passing fancy, it's not the job because we do 150 games. If you want to get better as a broadcaster and have Harry as a partner and learn how to broadcast, this would be the ideal job. And that's how I became a Chicago Cubs broadcaster. That's how I got to work 15 years with Harry. I wouldn't have traded it for the world. I think I actually got the job because they decided they should try putting a woman up there with him to see if he would, uh, if he could handle that a little bit better than the way he was training some of the guys that came through the booth. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Come here, let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only, only you. It was funny because when I would leave the booth to go down to the truck to do something, uh, to fill in doing graphics or whatever early on, and we would have someone fill in for me, I would have to spend half the morning translating for them. So it would be things like, okay, he's going to ask you for a root beer. There's no root beer in the press box. Just go get him a Pepsi. He won't know the difference. I've been doing it for years. If he asks you for a Cubs yearbook, he's looking for the Pirates Media Guide. If he wants a hot chocolate, there's a good chance he's gonna spit it up and say, you know, this coffee tastes like crap. <laughs> and just turn to him and say, well, you asked me for a hot chocolate, here's a hot chocolate. <laughs> if you want coffee, I'd be happy to go get you coffee. It was, I think in our second year, I was smoking a pipe occasionally and occasionally I would smoke a cigar. And it was one day out of the clear blue when Harry, and I happened to have a cigar that day, started picking on the cigars. And he'd go, how can a college-educated guy like yourself smoke those stinky, foul, terrible cigars? Well, did you spend eight cents on that one? I mean, that's horrible. And that became a running gag between us. The cigar thing turned out to be what Harry needed as the prop. When Stoney would light the cigar, Harry would go crazy. Put that smelly thing out, Steve. I always wondered if that was just a, a bit. Finally, I went to him one time, and I said to him, uh, do you really, I mean, does it really bother you that I'm smoking cigars in the booth? Because he used to tell everybody how horrible this was. And he goes, Steve, I've spent my life in smoke-filled bars. Do you think it bothers me outside with you smoking a cigar? He goes, that's one of the best bits we have. Go with it. Off the field, the charismatic Harry was just as popular with the fans. Well, they called Harry the mayor of Rush Street. You know, Harry liked a good time. Uh, Harry liked to be out on the town. Somebody many, many years ago said to Harry in the midst of one of his reveries, they said, Harry, what's it all about? He said, what's it all about, pal? Booze, broads, and bullshit. Harry uh, loved a good saloon. And when he was in St. Louis, he made many of them. I think he made just about every saloon in town. He was definitely a night owl. I mean, definitely a night person. And especially, you know, if, if Pete came up, he'd want to show Pete 
the whole town in, in three nights, and it was always three o'clock in the morning. But these two guys, they would stay, and then they'd go to another bar and go for the late night banana daiquiri, right? Well, I'd see Tatsis, we'd have to have to stop and get a banana daiquiri. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can always remember you talk about make sure Harry gets home okay. Uh, we'd start down State Parkway, which is pretty dark at four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> pretty scary. And uh, we'd start walking down, and uh, here's a car come up behind us and just drive real slow until we got to the Ambassador East. And I'm kind of looking over my shoulder, but Harry, he didn't pay attention. Finally, we get to the corner of Gothi and State Parkway, and Harry turned around and said, hey, thanks a lot, guys. And it was a, a squad car. <laughs> the police were following to make sure, he got, <laughs> make sure he got to the Ambassador East. He liked to have a couple martinis before dinner. so. You know, of course, you you have to drink with him. And the first time we were with him, uh, uh, I, I happened to uh, have a vodka on the rocks, and uh, and then he kept ordering. He had three. Then he had four. Well, by time, you know, I'm starving, and everybody's starving, and and I'm half in the bag because he doesn't. As soon as he's through with those martinis, we start eating, and. Uh, We'd have a ball all the time. You're just a wonderful man. It's about 1, 1.30. We dropped Harry off first. And Harry gets out, and the driver turns around, and he said, how old is that man? And I said, well, I don't know, he's 75, 76 at the, at the time. He said, I picked him up at 6.30 this morning. And I'm dropping them off at 1.30 in the morning. And I don't know how many drinks he's had through the course of the day. He said, he's remarkable. And I said, that's Harry. <laughs> you ever hear Harry Carey? He did the Cub games? Oh, God, he was a character. He was half in the bag by the third inning. <laughs> He'd say stuff like, hey, here comes Sandberg around third, safely in the second. I was 22 years old, and when you're 22, you can put it away. I mean, we drank, we went out, we had a lot of fun, but I remember one time we were in St. Louis, and the game had ended at like 1.15 in the morning, and we had a day game the next day. So, I mean, I'm exhausted. I go back to the hotel, I go to sleep, I wake up early the next morning, I'm dragging, my eyes are all puffy. I get in the elevator, and Harry gets in the elevator as well, and he says, hey, what did you do last night? I'm like, what did I do? It was 1.15, we had a day game, I went to bed. And then I'm like, what did you do? Oh, and I got this whole long story about how he went out and where he went and what he did, and I'm like, I just got put to shame by like an 80-year-old something man. He would always say that I left more drinks on bars than I ever consumed, and that's, that's probably true, but, you know, he had a cast iron constitution. He would stay up all night and be ready to go the next morning, but he, he was a guy that was just so full of life, I think he felt like if he sat down for a minute, and didn't go for it with all kinds of gusto and excitement that, that it would pass him by. He kind of violated every single law of nature. Never got eight hours sleep. Uh, you know, doctors would say don't eat late. He would eat late. You know, you probably shouldn't stay out late and drink. I think periodically he might have done that. But everything that you weren't supposed to do, Harry did his entire life and played by his own rules. He never missed a game and he never had a hangover. That was the amazing, the amazing thing to me. We had been out sometimes, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning. I'd meet him for breakfast. I said, how do you feel, coach? Oh, I feel great, I feel great. I said, you gotta be crazy. I said, how can you feel great? I said, you know, do you remember coming home? <laughs> so he was one of a kind. I want to see you pronounce where Pedro Martinez is from in the Dominican Republic. Mano Goyambo, it's very easy. <laughs> There you go. That's it. That's his Spell home that one backwards. <laughs> hey! Snoop Doggy Dog is in the house. You know, Snoop Doggy Dog backwards is Poots Gotti God. God. <laughs>
I would say everything that Harry did was a carefully orchestrated professional broadcast. However, he did have some problems with names. Here comes Brett Barbecue to the plate. And Stoney's like, yes, Brett Barbary is a very good, you know, <laughs> just, I mean, all the time. Uh, you know, I was Sign Randberg and uh, Ryan Santo. Ryan Sandberg, Sandy Reinberg, and Andy Bennis of the Padres, he had SD on his hat and said that he pitched for South Dakota. Montreal had a relief pitcher by the name of Jeff Parrott. And Harry would say, Harold Parrott coming in the game. And between innings, they'd say, why'd you call him Harold Parrott? His name is Jeff. Because, you know, I had a friend named Harold Parrott years ago. And he was always then Harold Parrott. He would do things like get Doug Mankiewicz right and then mess up Bob Jones. One year, we had Scott Sanderson, Jim Sundberg, myself. Harry would uh, change them, and they were playing everywhere all at once. Yeah. He couldn't get us straight for the whole season. George Bell was playing the outfield. He would say, pops it up to left. George Bush is under it. OK. He could also never pronounce Grudzelanik, and eventually said, well, all of his teammates call him the G-Man. As far as I know, none of his teammates called him the G-Man. Nobody really told Harry what to do. He kind of did what he wanted to do. Harry did a lot of things that were somewhat confusing. For instance, um, you might remember Delano DeShields. Well, Harry was broadcasting, and he just missed it by a little bit. I said, there's Delano DeShields, and he called him Delano DeSanders. And I said, no, that's Colonel DeSanders, but this is Delano DeShields, he's a second baseman. The most famous Harryism of all time. There was a fly ball in the shallow center field. Jorge Arte at second base, loses the ball in the sun, it drops. And Harry turned to Steve Stone and said, Hey, how does a guy from the Dominican lose a ball in the sun? Now, if I had said that, if anybody else had said that, they'd fire me before the inning was over. And it's like your grandfather at Thanksgiving dinner where he would call your date by the wrong name or something, and at the end of the meal, people loved him even more, but they would just say, ah, that's Harry. Harry was mercurial, and that's what made him so interesting. He was a living contradiction. One minute you wanted to strangle him, and the next minute you wanted to give him a kiss on the cheek. He was one of those guys that you could be friends with, and then the next moment you would say, oh my god, how could he possibly do that? It was a combination of cantankerous and lovable that was so strange that you just, there was a energy coming off of him that you just, you just loved him um, or hated him. Harry Carey and Steve Stone, they were like Abbott and Costello, you know, like even in vaudeville, you needed the, the straight man and the funny guy, you needed the, the fat guy and the skinny guy. I can't keep these big glasses on. Where are your, where's yours? You're wearing it. I remember one time in the booth, we were just talking about something, I was trying to help him out, and he got infuriated that I would question his eyesight, which at the time wasn't particularly good. There's a drive in a right center field, way back, might be out of here, could be. Well, he took exception to it one day and was yelling at me and he left. So he comes back in the booth, he puts his books down, I'm sitting there working on my stuff. He taps me on the shoulder, he goes, are you mad at me? I said, you're damn right I'm mad at you. He goes, you can't be mad at me. I said, why not? He said, because you're my friend. Now, what do you do with that? My favorite story is when he uh, met Elvis Presley for the first time. He, uh, he was down broadcasting a basketball game down in, like, uh, Tennessee. Elvis grew up listening to the Cardinals, and Elvis somehow hears that Harry's in town. And Harry got a phone call, and he said, Harry, yes. Is Harry Carey? He says, yes, it is. Who is this? He says, this is Elvis. Harry goes, Elvis who? He says, Elvis who? What city are you in? I'm in Memphis. He says, and you have to ask Elvis who? How many Elvises you think are here? And Harry said, oh, yeah, right. Come on, who are you trying to kid? And Elvis said, no, really, Harry, it is me. It's me, Elvis. So I'll prove it to you. Go downstairs in 20 minutes. 20 minutes, he went downstairs. His big limousine pulls up, opens the door. Harry goes, it might be. It could be. It is. It's Elvis Presley. And he's screaming, hey. And Harry said, why don't you come at halftime and be my guest? And he said, because Harry, they have a brand new field house, and if I came there at halftime, there probably wouldn't be a field house left. But I'll send my limo for you, and you'll come to Graceland. And they took him to Graceland. And there sit Harry Carey and Elvis Presley, drinking Budweiser and talking about the Cardinals. Spent the evening with Elvis, about 3, 3.30. Elvis figured out they hadn't eaten anything yet. And then Elvis says, oh my gosh, my manners, Harry. I bet you're hungry, we haven't eaten. Are, do, you, do you like ribs? And, and Harry goes, yeah, I love ribs. And he said he never met 
a better looking and more likable young man than Elvis Presley. How'd you like to be a fly on the wall that night at Graceland? Harry Carey and Elvis Presley. If this man could cast his spell over Elvis, there was no reason he couldn't do the same with the diehard Cub fans. Hosting the ultimate fan party each year was just the type of thing Harry was born to do. I said, Harry, I've got this idea. It's called the Cubs convention, and it's something we're going to do in the middle of winter. So I said, Harry, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make you the honorary chairman. And it's basically going to be a cocktail party that we're going to invite 10,000 of our fans to come to. And I, and I guess 21 or 22 years later, it's had 19 straight sellouts, and Harry had an enormous role in the success of that. With this toss, the 1993 baseball season gets underway. The last time the Cubs were in the World Series, was 50 years ago. That's the year I first started broadcasting, in 1945. Please, dear Lord, <laughs> while I'm still here, make sure the Cubs win one this year. Thank you very much. I just worry that uh, there'd be riots in the stands. You know, the, <laughs> hell, in the Crosstown Classic, there's riots. Now imagine if it counted. Are you kidding me? There'd be people thrown off the buildings for crying out loud. So um, I think that would be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it because we can't beat them during the <laughs> exhibition. Maybe, there, maybe what counts and Cubs can beat the White Sox. Harry was a professional celebrity. He loved being a celebrity. He loved being recognized. He worked at it. Taking over the role of a play-by-play -play announcer, Ronald Reagan at the <laughs> mic. Well, Harry, thank you very much. You know, in a few months, I'm going to be out of work, and I thought I might as well audition. Here comes the pitch. And it's a hard hit ball. It bounces off the third baseman and into left field. This butt's for you, Bill Murray. Thank you, Harry. I've been dying under these lights until you handed me this thing. It's such a pleasure to see you, especially on a noteworthy event like this one. We knew Bill Murray was coming up. And before the game, I said, I know you always ask about his mom. But his mother passed away a short time ago. So when Bill comes up, just don't say, How's your mom? And he goes, oh, OK. So I remind him Bill Murray was coming up in the third inning. And I reminded him at the end of the second, uh, Bill's coming up. Remember his mom? Oh, yeah, no problem. So now Bill walks in the booth. And Harry goes, Bill Murray, how's your mother? And he goes, Harry, my mother's dead. And don't ask me about my father, because he's dead, too. The fans absolutely loved Harry Carey and he knew they were a considerable part of his success. I've never seen people grab for somebody, want to talk to somebody, want to touch someone um, so much in my life. He was a man of the people. He truly enjoyed people. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He loved to laugh. He loved to hear jokes, but it didn't matter. He could be at lunch and he'd be nice to people who would throng to him and ask for autographs and stuff. I remember being at the old Sportsman's Park in St. Louis, being eight or nine years old. And uh, after a game, Dad would stand there. For, I'm hungry. You know, I want to go eat. He'd stand there for 45 minutes signing autographs till everybody who wanted one got one. And he felt that was part of his job. Most guys just, sorry, I'm late, I'm busy. Boom, off they go. In the booth, people used to go to the door to the press box every game leave a stack this high of notes please say hello to my uncle on the air please sign this for my sister you know and I would go through and I would sort of pick out a random few and then I would put the others aside well one day, and I would hand them to him and he would say hey Bob from you know Winnetka he's here today and then one day he's he gets up to leave the booth for something and he sees the stack and he's what is that and I'm like uh oh <laughs> I'm like, well, there's quite a few of them, Harry. We can't do all, I want all of them. I mean, he threw a fit. 
And I'm like, Harry, if I give you all, every single note that comes in here every day, we will do nothing but say hi to people in, in Illinois. Give well wishes to Bob Skiffington, the Budweiser man from Decatur. Quick throw, got him! I remember in 1984 when the Cubs lost to the San Diego Padres, he went in the hospital and I sent him a letter and I wrote him a poem. And I started out the poem by saying, we walk around from room to room, can't seem to chase this terrible gloom. And about a week later, I'm in my kitchen and the phone rings and I pick it up and this voice says, Joni? And I said, Harry? And he starts reciting the poem back to me. I couldn't believe it, I was so touched. You know, one of the things about Harry, he was one of these personalities where the whole essence of his appeal was that he was approachable, that the guy on the street felt connected to him. So you have some people who are extremely famous, and they may be recognized, asked for a picture, asked for an autograph, someone calls out to them, but there might be a greater distance for some. Some people admire certain celebrities at a distance because they don't feel like they can intrude. But the essence of Harry's whole thing was, come right up, throw an arm around my shoulder, have a beer. Hello again, everybody. Harry Carey from the center field bleacher. And a big crowd on hand on a beautiful day. When guys are as great as Harry Carey was, it's hard to compare, for example, a Harry Carey to a Vince Scully, to a Mel Allen, to a Red Barber, to a Russ Hodges. They're all great, and you can't go wrong with any of them. But one way to judge the greatness of a guy would be his relationship, his bond with the fans. And in that area, I don't think Harry has to take a back seat to anyone. I think Harry Carey bonded stronger with his audience. He was closer, he had a closer emotional link to the fans than any broadcaster who ever lived. I'm another grandchild of Harry Carey, Chip Carey's younger brother, Skip Carey's son. And we are here today to talk to some people about what they remember about Harry Carey. What's your favorite memory of Harry? Uh, well, it was when he was with the White Sox and he had that, that uh, fishing net. Uh -huh. And he would always scoop out for the, for the beer. He's always in the booth, always talking, making jokes about everything. Holy cow. <laughs> he made the game fun. He just had such a great time. It's big glasses. Holy cow. His glasses. Holy cow. <laughs> First question I have to ask you, is it White Sox or Cubs? It's the Cardinals. Cardinals? Oh, this is even better. For you guys who don't know, my grandfather started his career in St. Louis, where he broadcast his first 25 years. Now, did you listen to my grandfather growing up? Absolutely. Okay, what's your favorite memory about him? Oh, uh, gosh, just him and Jack Buck uh, bantering back and forth. Uh, it might be, it could be, it is. So now that you're at this game today, who are you rooting for? Yeah, yeah. The truth, I really couldn't care less. Hey, come on, take me out to the ball game. Cubs win, Cubs win. You gotta love that. When I think about my grandfather, I always think of Harry Carey and the Cubs games. I don't think the game have ever, has ever been called that way before or since. He'd tell the truth. That was the best part about listening to him and Jimmy. They weren't afraid to uh, uh, call out a player for not running out an infield ground ball or, uh, or hustling in the outfield. He's a people person. His excitement for the game? Always was laughing. You know, I love how he mumbled the names. I loved it. I mean, I'm from the South Side. I'm a native South Side of Chicago. There are just things that Harry would say and just the way that he had his audience. And then reading about how he was an orphan. And that touched me right there. There are times where it felt like he was talking to me. Oh, Harry meant fun and he meant baseball. Because Harry was like one of the guys the fact that he would have a drink and he would laugh and show more of his personality than just the balls and strikes. The popularity of Harry Carey, both on and off the field, gave him national recognition and brand status. But for all of his material success, he was never really concerned with the money. Money didn't mean anything to him, so it, the, the art of picking up a tab or something, that wasn't an act of generosity, it was an act of friendship. He, he liked people and he liked to share with people and so he, he picked up some, he would pick up bar tabs and restaurant bills and stuff. That wasn't an act of generosity, that was friendship. I don't really believe Harry knew how much money he had or how much money he did not have. He lived a great life. He's not, Harry wouldn't have been a good tourist, I think that if he 
flew to Paris and he saw the Eiffel Tower, he'd say, all right, very good, and be on the next plane going home. So money wasn't a big deal to him. What he liked was social interaction. He lived to go to dinner. He loved to go to dinner. Hey, Rich, how are you? How are you? The Harry brand continued to grow, resulting in a unique partnership with a Chicago-based restaurant. Originally, this restaurant was being built, and it was going to be a steakhouse, but it was going to be uh, called the H.I. Cobbs, which is the name of the architect that designed this National Historic Landmark you know, over 100 years ago. And people are like, well, does anyone know who H.I. Cobb is? And one of the partners that was coming in was good friends with you know, Harry Carey, and they said, well, what if we called it Harry Carey, brought him in? We're big fans of yours in Oklahoma. And I noticed in Dallas, they're all beautiful like you. <laughs> and he's very popular, and everyone said, wow, that's a great idea, and that's how it came to be. Harry got involved. Ever since then, people have just been lining up to get in, and it's gotten busier and busier every year for the last 20 years. We were in the, in the restaurant here one time, and there was a, a kid in a wheelchair, and he was, you know, obviously very disabled and the mother came up and said uh, you know would you speak to my son give him an autograph Harry autographed his cap had a picture taken with him autographed anything he had there and uh, Harry's uh, mother came up and said to Harry Harry you don't know what you just did for my son that gets to me <laughs> that story but it was a great experience to see how that mother reacted and just because Harry felt hey you know I'm gonna do it we got in the car and we started off and he looked at me and said boy we think we got problems and that to me is a story about Harry Carey that gets to me every time in his first 42 seasons Harry Carey never missed a single game but in February 1987 he would suffer a stroke that would keep him out of the booth for over a month WGN invited several guest announcers to fill in for him during that time. A whole bunch of people filled in for him during that stretch. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brent Musburger. Just filling in for our old friend Harry Carey today. It's like running an escort service. You have a different date every night. I talked to Harry a couple of days ago. He said, now remember, Ernie, it's not the American League. Harry, a swift, speedy, and come back recover. What I recall is I liked Steve very much, and it was an honor to fill in for Harry. I just ran back to the press box for a quick <laughs> beverage, and the next thing I know, it's one, two, three. The indestructible Harry bounced back, stronger than ever after the stroke. Harry came back to the booth after the stroke, and as was his style, he came back with a lot of fanfare, because Harry knew and always told me, Steve, it's showbiz. So they told him the president was gonna give him a call. Hello, this is Ronald Reagan, and I'm just joining all your other fans across the country and welcoming you back in the air today. Well, that's awfully, awfully nice. I really, I really, I don't know what to say. I certainly appreciate it, sir. He was telling us then about Nancy and her ties to Chicago, and just about the time he started talking about Nancy, Harry goes, Mr. President, I have to hang up. Bobby Dernier just got a bunt single. Looks like the Cubs have a rally. Boom, phone went down. Might have been the only guy around that ever hung up on the president. Certainly, he was the only guy that hung up on the president because Bobby Dernier got a bunch single. It's not often that the president of the United States has trouble getting a few words in edgewise. About halfway through my tenure there, he had that fall in Florida where we spent a few days in the hospital together. The Cubs were playing the Marlins. And I had gone downstairs to look for him because um, I, couldn't, I couldn't find him and he needed to be somewhere. And... Um, I went down the dugout hallway and there were paramedics and all kinds of people around him and he was lying on the floor. And uh, it turns out that he had a heart arrhythmia that nobody knew about. So his heart had stopped for a second and he had passed out. Smash his face on the wall going down and broke those really, really thick Coke bottle glasses that I didn't think it was possible at all to even scratch them. Um, you know, imagine yourself in the hospital with a relative, you know, a grandfather-type relative. That's bad enough. Um, the calls from family, concerned people, coworkers, and stuff like that, um, that's hard enough to deal with. Then imagine um, a press corps that wants video, information. I mean, we had to come out every day, and the doctor had to do a press conference every afternoon to update people on his condition. But the funniest part of it was um, I knew that President Clinton was going to call. 
So because nothing was being put through without permission, I thought, you know what, I, I know this should be a no-brainer, but I'm going to go down there and make sure they know to put this call through. So I go down to the front desk and I say to the woman, listen, um, the White House is going to call, so uh, make sure you put that call through when the time comes. And she goes, oh! And I'm like, what's the matter? She goes, oh no, well, um, somebody just called and said they were from the White House, but there's a retirement home down the street called the White House, so I hung up on them. I'm like, okay, that's all right. I'm guessing they'll call back. <laughs> so sure enough, they called back. She put the call through. And uh, I remember answering the phone, and the person on the other end of the line said, I have President Clinton for Harry Carey. And I said, I have Harry Carey for President Clinton. And we handed the phone over simultaneously. And uh, Harry spoke with him for a couple minutes and then said, OK, I, I have to go. And I thought, who, who hangs up on the president? Who says, OK, I've had enough of talking to the president. I've got to go. But he did. And I guess President Clinton said, OK, and they hung up. The stroke also gave Harry a new perspective on his personal life, and he finally reached out to his family. I don't know if it was the stroke, but he became more family-oriented later in life. It changed him quite a bit. He became much mellower, much more generous, uh, uh, sold with his family, with his kids. And in fact, it's the first time uh, that I finally got Harry to say, you know, we got to get the, this family together. I think later on, Harry figured it out because he spent a great deal of his life getting all the people in this country who really didn't know him to love him. And at the end, he realized that the thing to do is to have the people closest to you, your family, love you. I think it took Harry a long time to figure out that there's more to life than baseball games. There's more to life than being the Cub fan Bud Man. And ultimately, I'm, I'm very pleased and happy that he figured that out. But I think that would probably, if I had to guess, that would probably have been his, his biggest regret, that for someone who didn't have family and wanted it so desperately, didn't really understand the importance of it until the last 10 years of his life. But at least I'm glad he got that chance. The, the, the one great regret I have is that he and Chip didn't get to work together that what would have been his last year. The fact that I'm one of three generations, all of whom are broadcasting Major League Baseball at one and the same time, it's never been done before. Hi, I'm Chip Carey, Major League Baseball announcer. And I'm Skip Carey, Major League Baseball announcer. And I'm Harry Carey, Major League Baseball announcer. Will the real Major League Broadcasting Carey please stand up? And of all the things that have happened to me in 50 years of broadcasting, this is the thing I'm proud of self, because this is my family. And I remember the phone call uh, distinctly. I was living in Orlando, and I called him, and I said, well, it only took me 30 some odd years, but I finally found a partner. And he laughed. And uh, he said, well, I'm really excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. And uh, it felt like, OK, this is the right time to do this. But it wasn't meant to be. Harry and Chip would never get that chance to be the first grandfather-grandson combination in the booth. You know, it was Valentine's Day, of course, and it was hard to get a reservation into anything, but they told him who he was, and, and then they said, OK, they would set something up for us. So we went to dinner, and we had a really nice dinner. Uh, Tony Martin, I believe, was uh, the entertainer there that night. And then everything was over, and it was getting late. It was about midnight, I guess, so uh, we decided to leave. And somebody said to me, Harry went down. I go, what do you mean Harry went down? And I look, and he's on the floor, and they're giving him mouth to mouth. And I'm just like, I'm in shock. On February 18, 1998, Harry Carey passed away. But we're going toward the cathedral again for the burial service. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. Businessmen would put their briefcases down and stand and salute like they were still in the arm. Construction workers took off their hats and put it over your, their hearts. And my dad said, look at that. They loved the guy, you know, they just absolutely loved him. So many people were, were walking up, oh, we're so sorry, you know, people are crying and carrying, you know, Harry Carey pins and badges and the glasses and everything else. And he would have been so happy with it. I mean, 
who has a funeral that's televised? The Pope. I mean, that just tells you, it's gotta tell you something. Mary's funeral was televised on WGN. And I'm watching that funeral and being 100% Irish, the funeral was like an Irish wake where Mike Rorty and Father John Smith and Pete Von Aachen were standing there telling these wonderful Harry Carey stories. And I said, man, I don't want this to end. Executive Vice President of the Chicago Tribune, Jim Dowdle. Humor was such an important ingredient to Harry's personality. He brought such enthusiasm to his broadcast, which made him into the greatest salesman for baseball, and particularly the Cubs, and even Budweiser. Harry joined WGN and the Cubs 16 years ago, and Wrigley Field was never the same. We enjoyed his provocative description of baseball, his interesting pronunciation of players' names, <laughs> the seventh inning stretch with that great singing voice. Speaking of pronunciation, one day last season, Michael Jordan came out to the game. He was up in a box, and a Cub representative asked him if he would go to the broadcast booth to be on the air with Harry. Michael said no. Asking him why, he said, I watch the Cubs a lot, and I love Harry, but I don't want to go on the air with him and have him introduce me as Michael Jackson. <laughs> you know, Harry hadn't had a drink for the last four and a half or five years, and you never heard the end of it. How bad non-alcoholic beer and wine were, and if this was the most fun you could have, then what a dull life. <laughs> Poor Dutchie would listen to this incessantly. Every time they go to the doctor, he would whine, just can I have a couple martinis? And then finally, the doctor got tired of his whining and said, you could drink. And Harry got all excited. The doctor said, you can have two martinis if the Cubs make it to the World Series. <laughs> Doctor sure went out on a limb on that one. His funeral is the most fun I've ever had at a funeral. <laughs> I know that sounds really strange, but when Pete Van Aken got up there to give his speech, I, I can't imagine anybody that was at that funeral or watched that funeral doesn't remember Pete's speech. Yes, I am Pete Van Aken, a friend of Harry's for 48 years. And today, he put me to the supreme test of our friendship. Because first, I had to usher. Now I have to give this little, this is not a eulogy, it's a tribute. And I know I won't have to drive the hearse because he always told me I was the lousiest driver in the world. Pete Van Aken gave that speech that was a classic. They say, they say, what does it take to be such a close friend of Harry's? I said, it's easy, unlimited stamina. A cast iron stomach, keep your bag packed and your divorce lawyer on retainer. You know, the good Lord was sitting on my shoulder because I'm not that good. I'm, I'm really not that good. And I finally turned to Father Bob and said, I'm running a little over Father Bob, but they're liking it, so I'm going to. I kept going. We we're taking a walk one day. Way up above, somebody said, hey, Harry, hey, Harry. I said, Harry, God's calling. <laughs> well, you know, and Harry in his brass way says, what do you want, God? But, <clears throat> but it wasn't God. Nine or 10 stories up on the building was a scaffold with four construction workers. And of course, Harry responded immediately and they hollered back, can we get an autograph? Sure. The workers lowered the scaffold in nine or 10 stories, and for 15 minutes, they stood there, shook his hand, and he signed autographs. He made their day. They, these were his people, the construction workers, the bus drivers, the cab drivers, the bartenders, and just the guy on the street. Also, the other Harry Carey I knew was compassionate, had a zest for life with an endless desire to be with people. He'd dive into a crowd like everyone was his best friend. Now Harry's up there in heaven with the old gang. And you know, because of our faith, 
who realized most of us must make a stop in purgatory for a little attitude adjustment, then hopefully on to heaven. Not Harry, he's in Ben Stein's limo, probably, probably got St. Peter driving because we all knew it took a saint to drive for Ben. <laughs> or Jack Gaughan has tipped the doorman, the valet Parker, and the maitre d'. Gino Michelotti, Gina Giorgetti's is cooking the steaks. Emmett O'Neill is mixing the drinks. Bill Beck has got his shower set up there in center field. Harry's leaning back, lifting his glass, ready to call the game and saying, holy cow, this is not so bad, I can drink again. I actually felt really bad for the guy who went after him. <laughs> what a speech from Pete Van Aken. He took up all the time. <laughs> but one that I'll never forget. It's the greatest tribute to a friend I think I've ever heard. We attempted to capture his storied nightlife in Chicago with a series of uh, commercials. In one, we had Harry doing the boogie, dressed like one of the Blues Brothers, dancing through the loop. People asked, how did you get him to do that? I said, it was easy. We just followed him home one night. <laughs> Most baseball fans in America loved Harry Carey. He was a showman, no doubt. But above all, he cared about the game and he cared about the fans. He left St. Louis a long time ago, and yet, next to Chicago, St. Louis and what we call Cardinal Country were rocked by his loss. He led a life that most of us can only dream of. He lived life every golden moment of it. He was a Cub fan and a Bud man. There are thousands of souls who love baseball waiting for Harry upstairs. And I think they're giving him that standing ovation right now. And they're saying, welcome home, Harry. Welcome home. And if you listen closely, last Wednesday afternoon, when Harry's soul approached the gates of heaven, you could hear St. Peter yell, it might be, it could be, it is Harry Carey, holy cow. God bless you all. After the day of the funeral, the restaurant was closed, but we opened it up to all of Harry's friends. And afterward, everyone was raising a glass and telling their Harry stories and cheering to Harry, more like celebrating his life instead of mourning his passing. Everybody wanted to participate in some way saying goodbye to this, who was nothing but a short, overweight, not terribly attractive, big glass hanging on his face, sports announcers. But he made his mark and he touched people. On February 18th, the Cubs organization, the city of Chicago, and the sport of baseball experienced the loss of a legend. At this time, we ask that you please join us in a moment of silence for Harry Carey. I think uh, Harry was really a fun, loving guy. The fact is I got, got to watch him mature into a very caring, very loving human being you know, was, was a lot of fun. That's what I'll remember. He had three top-notch careers at three different places. I mean, St. Louis and the White Sox and Cubs. You take any one of those careers and just leave it at that, and any one of those would have been great. I just don't see that ever happening in broadcasting again. And I don't think that there is a broadcaster today in Chicago who's over the age of 40, who doesn't from time to time, somehow in some way, find hooks where they imitate Harry Carey. He is irreplaceable, and I think that legacy where every day you see that silhouette of Harry at the booth of Wrigley Field is a great tribute to what we once had. All of it seemed to come together, though, in one grand package. He was special. I think the one thing about Harry that kind of came across to me, what you saw is what you got. Eight years after he is gone, I guarantee you that if you listen closely, when the seventh inning comes around, you'll hear some fan say, Harry, Harry, as he looks up to the booth during the seventh inning stretch. If you don't remember anything else about Harry Carey, remember this, Harry Carey had magic, and very few people have magic. Who wouldn't take this deal? You live the life you always wanted to live. You live into your 80s, and along the way, he made millions of people happy, Millions of people will remember him fondly. The mere mention of his name will make them smile. 
And so, unlike his signature call, it wasn't it might be, it could be. No doubt about it, he was Harry Carey, the one and only.